traumatic elbow instability and terrible triad injuries. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Wade Gordon and Chris Grandizio. I'm Sakya Brahman narrating. So this is what we're going to cover in the first video. We're going to talk about anatomy, classification, and simple dislocations. And in the second video, we will cover complex dislocations, mostly the fracture dislocations uh, section. And then in the third video, we will focus a little bit more on terrible triad and on also go through complications, sequelae, things like chronic dislocation and instability. So the important anatomy to understand here are that there are primary static constraints or stabilizers and then secondary constraints or stabilizers and then dynamic constraints. So let's go let's go through these. Here you're seeing a depiction of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament, but we'll we'll go through that here as well. So the primary constraints are the ulna humeral articulation number one. Uh, and inflection, the coronoid, and in extension, it's the olecranon at the back end. Second uh, primary uh, stabilizer is the anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament. Okay, that is that is shown here. And then the third primary stabilizer is the lateral collateral ligament, or the, which has four components: the lateral ulnar collateral ligament radial collateral ligament, accessory uh, collateral ligament, and annular ligament, and that is shown in the upper drawing to the right. And um, we'll talk a lot about that again when we get to uh, talking about the um, posterior lateral rotatory instability. The secondary static constraints or stabilizers are the joint capsule itself, the radial capitellar articulation, um, and the common flexor and extensor origins. And then dynamic constraints are essentially the muscle units that cross up the elbow joint, the anconeus, the triceps, the brachialis. These provide compression forces across the joint and proprioception. So when you get a traumatic dislocation, let's say, uh, leading to instability, uh, the primary mechanism is posterolateral. Uh, there are other mechanisms, um, but uh, most of it is considered to be posterolateral in most cases. Um, medial dislocations are another rare uh, mechanism that can cause this. But let's focus a little bit more on the posterolateral mechanism. So uh, this is thought to occur with a progression from lateral to medial, as shown in this, uh, in this diagram here. So here you can see... Um, starting with number one, failure at the lateral collateral ligament. And then that progresses basically around the elbow, sort of in a circular direction. And you, as you can see above, um, you're starting here in the elbow in the reduced position. Then you have posterolateral rotatory instability in which you can see the radial head now subluxing posteriorly at the radiocapitellar joint, especially when you are in a uh, position of valgus, axial compression, and supination. Um, and uh, then you can have sort of a perched situation and then uh, frank dislocation. So, and we'll come back to these concepts again and again. Um, so evaluation, history and physical exam is typically diagnostic. Uh, you want to remove any field splints or dressings, look at the skin, do a careful neurovascular exam pre and post reduction. Uh, AP and lateral radiographs uh, will help to identify if there is a dislocation and the direction and if there's any fractures, which is really important. If you're not sure, or if there are fractures that you need to better characterize, uh, you may need advanced imaging, uh, like CT scanning, for instance. Um, and sometimes you know you may get this post reduction. And we talk about these concepts simple and complex. So when you talk about a simple elbow dislocation, you're basically just saying there's no fracture, right? So it's just a pure ligamentous injury. And the term complex dislocation typically means a fracture dislocation. So for some reason that term is used uh seems almost exclusively in the elbow, but 
Um, that is a term many people are going to use, so you should be familiar with it. So when someone says a complex elbow dislocation, it means there's a fracture, a coronoid, a radial head, montagia, uh, along with the dislocation. Uh, then there's the concept of terrible triad, which is the elbow dislocation with radial head and coronoid fractures. And then uh, you can also have chronically dislocated elbows. So the key to success is obtaining and maintaining ulnohumeral joint integrity. So this is what you really need to have. It goes without saying, but that is what is what you're striving for with, with treatment of these. So uh, again, simple dislocations, no fracture. Um, the mechanism we already talked about, um, you should understand uh, that posterior lateral rotatory mechanism. Um, posterior and posterior lateral are most common. Um, beware, if you do see other mechanisms, they could be more unstable. Mechanism of injury, usually um, partially flexed elbow, axial load, supination, and valgus. Um, this is a, something that we're going to come back to when we talk about, um, you know, when you're evaluating uh, patients, uh, maybe you've had chronic issues and may have uh, a reduced elbow, but they get posterolateral rotatory instability and it's symptomatic, they will tell you that they maybe have pain when they um, get up from a seated chair, right? And then they put their hands on the armrests or the sides of the chair. And then what you do, are essentially doing is you're supinating your little bit of valgus and then there's some axial load. When you do a... Um, pivot shift test to then try and assess for that as well in the clinic, uh, you are essentially uh, reproducing this mechanism of axial load, supination, and valgus, and then you bring it into a position of reduction and you get that sort of pivot shift. Um, there's some controversy over where the injury occurs first and is more severe. Um, Sean O'Driscoll has done a lot of work uh, describing this, and I encourage you to look at some of those um, manuscripts and review papers in which um, this is described. We uh, talked about this sort of um, uh, injury pattern going in a somewhat of a circular pattern around the elbow. So treatment, close reduction, right? So uh, almost always can be done in the emergency department. Sometimes you may have to do it in the operating room under anesthesia. Depends on your workflow considerations and where you can get sedation, but you want to get this done expeditiously. Most are stable after reduction. Um, these are going to be splinted in flexion. Uh, that is usually what's going to keep them stable. Uh, and then you can sometimes do range of motion within a stable range, meaning if they're going to dislocate in full extension, then they don't come out to full extension right away. Um, so you can treat with sling only and early uh, mobilization as an option, or you can do a short course of immobilization and splinting. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the key is to make sure that they are reasonably stable after reduction. Um, Follow-up x-rays can be done, uh, to, especially after initiating range of motion, and you want to make sure that you have concentric reduction and you don't have any residual subluxation. Here's an example of a simple elbow dislocation, AP and lateral images. Uh, this is likely going to be treated non-surgically. However, if you have recurrent instability or inability to get a reduction, then you may have to consider operative management. How do you reduce them? Well, adequate sedation, muscle relaxation. Uh, you want to minimize articular damage to the trochlea during reduction. You don't want a really a, an aggressive or traumatic reduction. Um, so with axial traction to a partially flexed elbow, sometimes supination, and then some flexion. And then you, you can kind of use your hands and then your thumb or thumbs uh, to... Uh, essentially push the olecranon distally and anteriorly um, or essentially distally while your fingers are anteriorly on the uh, on the um, elbow and then you will often get the reduction uh, gently flex the elbow and then you're going to check images to confirm reduction 
So rehab, um, short-term immobilization and early motion, if stable, uh, you want to make sure it's moving within a stable range. And oftentimes you're not going to go all the way out to full extension right away. Um, hinge braces can be used. They're usually not necessary. Uh, if the hinge is not in the right spot or the, 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 the brace kind of shifts or slides down with gravity to a bad position and it could be counterproductive um, and you can allow return to you know light duty perhaps at two weeks and full activity at 10 to 12 weeks. So we talked a lot about this, you know, immobilization or do you let them move early? So early motion is only appropriate if you're stable through range of motion after reduction. So once you get the reduction, the person reducing it, it would be great if they could document this. How stable was it after reduction? Um, so you could immobilize, uh, you could do early motion. Uh, in this particular study, they showed, they looked at three weeks of immobilization versus early motion. And they found uh, the early motion group had better motion at six weeks, but then it was equivalent thereafter. So bottom line is short-term immobilization and early motion are both appropriate. Um, you have to make sure it's really stable. So uh, you have to monitor closely. You have to get x-rays when they come back to the office. Ensure that you have a concentric reduction as you initiate that early motion. And here you can see an example where the radio capitellar joint is not congruent. Um, what we didn't really review is that uh, you do need to make sure that the uh, radial head lines up with the capitellum on all views. And what I mean by that is you should be able to draw a line that goes through the radial head that, that goes through the center of the capitellum. So if you have a perfect lateral x-ray, that should really... Uh, both on your lateral x-ray and then on the AP as well, right? So if you have a line through the radial head, that should really bisect the capitellum. And you can see that it doesn't, right? So uh, this is something, on the AP, it's sometimes a little more obvious. Sometimes on the lateral, if you don't get a good lateral, it could be difficult to recognize that there's slight incongruity and most likely that radial head is usually going in a posterior direction so you really have to demand excellent radiographs perfect laterals and make sure that that line through the radial the center of the radial head bisects the capitel and it's not sitting posterior like it is here here's an example 56 year old male fall on outstretched hand Posterior lateral elbow dislocation, as you can see here, post reduction. So let's look at that, right? So here is your line through bisecting the radial head, goes through the middle of the capitellum. Here, not a perfect lateral x ray. I'm going to argue that the capitellum is probably this here. Uh, and you can see bisecting the, um, so. That's what you want to see on your AP and lateral views. You really have to get perfect lateral views where you don't have this, for instance, this double density here. You want to make sure that you get perfect laterals so you can really convince yourself that uh, the joint's congruent. What if you're unstable after reduction? Well, it can happen. I mean, here's an example where on the upper view, you can see uh, the elbow is reduced. All right, so perfect lateral, radial head bisect the center of the capitellum. Uh, and then on the image below, you can clearly see that that is unstable and comes to the office and is dislocated. So it's uncommon, but if it happens, you may have to think about um, soft tissue reconstruction. Um, you may have to just do something else to get a concentric reduction and keep it there. So that could be splinting and a little bit more flexion within reason. Um, it could be an external fixator, you know, a static one or a hinged one that allows motion. Uh, and you could also do cross pinning across the joint or uh, sort of these newer internal uh, hinge uh, fixator devices. So here's an X-fix. So with an X-fix, uh, you can put two pins in the humeral shaft. Usually these are five millimeter pins. Uh, the radial nerve is... Uh, 
at risk for sure. And uh, you want to put these pins in under direct visualization through an open incision where you ensure and convince yourself that the radial nerve is not in the path. In the ulnar shaft, you can use four millimeter pins, typically can be placed percutaneously in that location. Um, and you could use a static external fixator for two to three weeks, um, or you know you can use a fancier external fixator with a hinge and uh, allow for motion. So um, hinged external fixators can then be used as definitive management. Um, they can help to maintain motion while maintaining reduction if they're done properly. Um, and you have to make sure when you do these that they... So when you put them on, you have to get a lateral x-ray in the operating room and make sure you have a concentric reduction through the full range of motion. And if your center of axis or rotation is off, um, potentially you won't get that and you may sublux at certain points of flexion. So you got to make sure that center of axis or rotation is perfect and usually the devices help you uh, identify that. There is also, as shown in the bottom image, um, internal fixators that are commercially available. Here you can see there's actually a small plate and screws on the ulna, and it's linked to a sort of pin here. Uh, a little bit better seen here. So here's a little plate on the ulna. Here's the pin that's going through the center of the axis of rotation, and you create this little you know, hinge device here that is essentially an internal hinge. And then this can be kept in place and then eventually removed, um, but this would uh, allow stability while allowing motion of the elbow. Cross spinning um, is a more simple technique, can be useful uh, uh, when you're unable to otherwise maintain a concentric reduction of a simple dislocation, and you can put 2.8 to 3.2 millimeter pins, depending on the patient's size, uh, verify the reduction, um, you can add anti-grade pinning of the radiocapitella joint if necessary. Definitely important to remove these pins um, before you get too far along. They can break, um, and of course they can introduce infection. Um, so certainly not the most utilized technique, but um, if you wanna make sure you maintain reduction at all costs and you don't want to have a chronically subluxed or dislocated elbow, which is a huge problem, uh, then this is a simple technique that uh, this is what's available to you, and you can monitor closely. This can work. So simple dislocations are uncommonly unstable after reduction, but when they occur, it's probably from a higher energy injury uh, that just has extensive soft tissue injury, uh, a lot of those you know, dynamic stabilizers may be um, compromised as well as some of your other static uh, constraints. We also do see these a little bit more in older women from low energy mechanisms. Um, and uh, these can require late soft tissue reconstruction. So we're going to pause there. We'll pick up with uh, complex elbow dislocations in the next video. Thanks.